you know, we entered into, I would say, the third phase, which is the point where I, I you know, lose the connection with myself. And I, I think that whenever I finally do that, I think that maybe one day I might be happy again. If you guys have never watched Asmin before, it will be a treat. So Asmin is a content creator, a streamer, one of the top, very interesting. He does a video every so often about his life and people are often confused by his life choices. If you've never been to this bubble, please sit back and relax. It's very interesting. But throughout this video, I pre-watched. It is actually quite interesting, the realizations he has, but also the level of introspection he goes to, which I already have a theory about his level. If you guys are interested in my philosophy system, links down below of the levels. I definitely have an idea of where he lands. And it's interesting. Watching this video, what do you guys think? Here we go. Asmin titled, I've been living like an animal for 13 years, so here's why. Hey guys, it's me, and today I want to answer a question. FYI, Asmin's name is also Zach, so you'll hear me calling him Asmin and Zach. ...that a lot of people have been asking me my whole life, and more importantly, they've been asking me a lot recently, especially online. And that question comes in many forms, but it always distilled down to the same thing, which is, in one form or another, why are you like this? Whether it's the dead rat alarm clock, the uh, barbecue uh, puke shower curtain, uh, dead animals in the house, or any other one of the stories that are just an indicator of me living like a complete f***ing animal, um, people always wonder, why would a person live like this? Why would a You know, great questions all around. Right now, I have him at regular speed. Let me know if you want me to go up one to 1 1.2 just because we usually watch things fast here but i also you know i want you to hear his tone and how he talks about his life also look how clear his skin is his skin is so clear and he just eats beef jerky and soda all day in mcdonald's and it's very interesting and then you know the way he even like uh grooms or showers very infrequently now i have a theory that asmin's autistic yet the, the other day on stream he even dropped a little hint that maybe I just read into, but he was like, guys, this pe person we're watching on stream is definitely autistic and how would I know? And then he like looked at screen and kind of winked and I was like, I think he's autistic just because of his sensory issues, his like, the way he describes his life, but you tell me what you think watching this, okay? Could a person be like this? Why am I, why am I like this? And I think that honestly, uh, you know, there's a lot of answers for this. I, I really, really, really don't want to make this like a super long video. So hopefully I can distill it down to some main points and not really go off on too many tangents, although I think that I probably will, because there's a lot of like history with it and everything like that. And so basically the first thing you need to know about me is that uh, I actually, if you can believe this, I know this might sound shocking, is that I actually have not always been like this. Uh, this is a relatively new thing for me. And uh, I think that it really kind of started a lot when uh, I would say in high school and then uh, later on it kind of entered phase two and that was probably somewhere around 21 or 23 somewhere around there in those age groups and that's whenever you know the degeneracy really kind of went uh you know it ratcheted up to the next level i leveled up new expansion release dlc etc right and so this happened then because as a kid um i was actually very much like a very conscientious a very conscientious kid in the way that i uh basically didn't really want to be uh, perceived in a negative way i wanted to be seen as a good person etc and uh i've always had a big problem with uh, being able to like relate to other people uh, because I think that I'm just a little bit off, right? I, I wouldn't say that I don't have a moral compass, but I would say that my moral compass doesn't point north. And this has been a problem in a lot of cases. Okay, right there, we'll stop. Okay, I'm gonna comment a lot during this. So just like everybody sit back and relax. Asmin has a very interesting relationship with morals and ethics. He has very strong opinions, often falls a little bit more centrist, but leaning left. Though a lot of people think he's conservative and he might be. He definitely is the kind of guy that would vote Trump for like money reasons or vote Trump because he think it'd be funny. But he also is somebody who talks to Hassan and they can come to same conclusions about Palestine and Israel. So that's a little nuanced. He has moments where he's definitely appealing to that like very specific kind of boy bubble. But then, you know, he also will rightfully understand like a female perspective enough to explain to his male audience why they're being degens. So he has like a lot of interesting back and forth insights, but the way he talks about his morals, how many neurodivergent people think they're like bad people when they're really just neurodivergent and perfectly decent people because they think the rest of the world is more morally aware than they are. And he'll say this in just a second, but just a reminder, People aren't born with a moral understanding. They learn it through culture and their surroundings. 
So this idea that like everyone knows what right and wrong is, is not true. This is a bullshit lie people have convinced themselves of to like pretend, but they're not. So just, okay. Oh, Discord says I resonate so much with that Asmin video. It's a great video. Okay, let's keep going. Is in my life, whether it's with relationships or friendships or anything in between, I've had a lot of problems because of that. And in the process of this, I've learned a lot of things about myself. And the main thing is that uh, my take and my view on moral issues is not really what I would say a normal person thinks. A normal person thinks. Most people also pretend that they're morally good. Right. Or most people pretend they have moral ideas of what it right and wrong is. I have seen I have seen Asmin have more consistent moral opinions than other streamers that pretend to have moral opinions. Like I have seen Asmin be very consistent with Dr. Disrespect, you know, all the other stories of the scandals that have come out in terms of sexual deviancy. I've seen him give very strong opinions about cheating and other things. And I've seen him have more consistency in his values than other people that pretend to have the moral high ground because they're secretly doing it behind closed doors anyways. So that's the thing about Asmin. Would Asmin cheat on somebody? I'm going to say no because it doesn't work within his moral compass, but the same people that claim to have good morals would still cheat on their spouses. And I think that's why I see Asmin. And I think, hmm, he feels, he feels like a consistent person, like a, like I can rely on him to be consistent with what he says. I can also rely on him to maybe vote for Trump because he think it'd be funny. But at the same time, like, I'd rather, you know, take a Trump voter that's pro LGBT and doesn't cheat on their spouses than a liberal who says that they're pro LGBT that cheats on their spouses. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll take, you know, I mean, another, I, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay. And this has caused me a lot of problems, and especially like as a young kid, uh, you know, being able to like interact and fit in with people, it's a weird dichotomy because the truth is I actually always did have a lot of friends and uh, I never had problems making friends. But at the same time, I always felt like I was very different from a lot of other. See, I never had problems making friends, but I always felt like I was different. Story of my life. I have no, everybody wants to be my friend. But then people get, they're like, oh, you're not as normal as I thought you were. Okay, bye. And they're like, aren't you like, like, aren't you upset that I don't want to be your friend? I'm like, nope, bye. And that's how I feel like Asmin is a bit where he's just like, okay, bye. But that's the thing is like, everyone wants to be his friend. But then what does it mean to be Asmin's friend for real? And that's hard to know. I don't know. But I know for me, like being my friend for real is a, it's really hard because I require so little of my friends. <laughs> and that's hard for people. Like, like, I require so little for my friendship to be friends. That is confusing to people, right? I don't know if Asmin's similar in that way, but that that's what that sentence said to my brain. I don't know if he would agree with that though. You know, that's not true. Chat says you're not vapid. He is. I don't know what that word means in this context. Hold on. I feel like I know what that means. Offering nothing that is stimulating or challenging. Um, I mean, it's subjective, right? Like, I think that's kind of subjective. Like, I think Asmin is that for a lot of people, right? I don't know. The people, because of the way that I felt, uh, I used to have, uh, for a comparison, uh, just a point of reference, I guess you could say, um, I used to have my mom read me uh, all of the different, like, sins in the Bible and everything because I, I understood, even as a little kid, I'm like, hmm, there's something wrong with you. Uh, you know, like, you, you better learn this so that way there aren't any problems in the future. And so I would have her... That is everyone, though. Asmin, I think, is just aware of it, which is why there's a pipeline between neurodivergence and awareness that does exist, not for all people, no one's a monolith, but I think he might fall into that category of just enough neurodivergence, a specific type of relationship with his neurodivergence, his curiosity. Asmin's a curious person. He wants to know everything about every bubble. The reason I like Asmin is because when people are like, oh, have you heard about this kink? He's like, oh yeah, I know about that. I saw it on the internet. I read about it. Oh yeah, I know about that. I read about it. Yeah, some people just do that. Yeah, some people are happier that way. Yeah, that's a thing people do. He's very okay with different bubbles existing. He'll have his opinions, but he's also, he doesn't say, oh, no shot. He's not like, that's not real. He's not like, he's not like, that doesn't happen. He's like, no, that happens. Like, Asmin's like, oh, that happens. If you name one niche community, Asmin's like, yeah, I know about this. And that means he's curious. So then he's self-aware enough to know that he needs to pay attention to the Ten Commandments versus how many, quote, neurotypicals or neurodivergents who don't think about it 
just go, I know what the Ten Commandments are, but they'd be out here lying and cheating, saying, oh my God. You know what I'm saying? Like he is on purpose as a child saying, I have to attempt to be a good person because it's not natural to me. It's not natural to anybody. People have to learn how to be good people. That's why the environment you're raised in makes the biggest difference because we raise children who become adults. And even if you raise your kid to the best of your ability, maybe there's genetic factors, but for the most part, you are a product of your environments. That's why bringing generational curses is so hard. And I have a theory that you break generational curses 10% every generation. So you're never the child to break it, which means you are also the child to continue some generational curse. I'll have a podcast about that coming out. So Asmin is aware of it, but just because he's aware of it doesn't mean other people have it naturally and he doesn't. He's just doing the extra step of actually having to do the work, which funny enough makes him more introspective her read all these to me that way i would understand how to behave right because it just never came naturally to me things that come naturally to other people uh were not natural and are not natural it's not like things have changed if anything they've probably gotten worse uh as as i've gotten older and is that not the most autistic thing anyone's ever said and so uh i've always had a big problem uh being able to like uh you know understand like where you know how you should act how you should treat people what you should do how you should say things i recently saw him go to a museum with tectone and emmy and he was so obviously neurodivergently scripting and masking. And I thought it was so lovely. He was trying really to make the guide feel loved and welcomed. He was really trying to ask him questions and be appropriate with reactions. Like he was going out of his way to make sure that the guide felt like he was listening. And I could tell because I was like, oh, I do this. I do this. So again, I'm relating it to myself because obviously those are the parts that go, oh, wait, I recognize that I could be wrong. I don't want to project, but that could, that feels like, oh, I do that. And it's not that it's fake. It's that I'm almost over exaggerating what a person, like, I don't know what a typical person would do, but I'm almost like, I just want to reassure that person that like, I'm very interested. I am listening, which is interesting. And he said that he wants to do, he wants to act nice socially because he wants people to feel like good. He doesn't want people to feel bad about themselves. And I think that stands out to me. Etc. So almost everything that I do is a learned performance rather than an innate social, uh, I don't know, like an instinct, if that makes sense. Now, of course, the cringy boy bubble will be like, he's a sociopath, you know, he's Dexter, Dr. House. He's probably just autistic. But also, this is the thing that's interesting about being a person. I think a lot of neurotypicals suffer in this where they're always trying to figure out the script. But it's just felt differently. The mechanism is done differently. Now, I don't know how true this is, but when I got diagnosed with borderline, which by the way, all of it is a construct. So we're figuring out what that means anyways. And now that I'm in remission, it's a very different experience. But my therapist said uh, a human brain that isn't borderline might, like if they see something they don't understand, will filter it very quickly, automatically. They don't have to think about it. They just take it for granted because their brain filters it. Your brain doesn't do that. So you have to think about it first and then filter it manually. I think when you have to manually do a lot of things, you do become more introspective if you're lucky. I think the reason like the ThoughtSpot made a video about neurodivergency and introspection and the pipeline, and some people were upset with that video, but I think she's right that with the right level of neurodivergency where you manually have to do a lot of the work, you actually have now more introspection because you have to ask yourself why are you doing this. If you live in a world where your brain automatically filters out and you don't have to think about it, then you're not, that's why you don't have to be introspective because you don't ever have to think, why am I doing this? I have to think, why am I doing this? Why am I chewing my food this way? Why am I breathing this way? Like I'm thinking about how I breathe. People don't think about how they breathe. Like I'm thinking about breathing and I'm like, that's weird. Like people don't have to think about that. And I think that's what's interesting about Asmin is he's basically explaining how he has to manually input information, which I think from my limited understanding is neurodivergency. And uh, hopefully the performance is good. I consider myself kind of a good actor, at least, right? But of course, there are going to be cracks and outtakes as well. And so those are usually the fo in the form of the Twitter clips with 100,000 likes. And so anyway, uh, as a kid, I was always treated this way. And, uh, you know, people people thought that I was a little bit off, a little bit weird. Uh, like one time, like, for example, uh, there was a, a kid that was like, playing baseball with him. And uh, he was annoying me, making me mad. And so uh, I hit the ball and I hit it with the explicit intention of hitting him in the face with the ball. And I did. 
And so I, I remember there's blood all over the kid's face. He like broke his tooth and everything. And everybody was standing around like, like what the fuck? Like, what? I, this is like terrible. And I remember walking up. I was, this was like the best day of my fucking life. This happened. And I was so happy. And I could see. Do you think that's his sense of justice, which, by the way, is also a negative to a positive when people say like, oh, I have a neurodivergent sense of justice. It is bad and good because it's crippling. It's like you feel like the world is so unfair because like, oh, this bad thing is happening. And maybe this is a part of his sense of justice, possibly that he's like, hey, you wronged me. I'm going to wrong you back And the world thinks that's wrong. But it feels like and then, of course, you out, you kind of outlearn that you outlearn that. Even if you think it's justified, maybe it isn't because what does justified even mean? But maybe that's where that came from or maybe it's not. But I don't think this is abnormal. Let's be real. It is not abnormal for people to hurt each other. We're in Lebanon right now. You obviously think it's okay to hurt people. That's what I'm saying. The world that's like Asmin's crazy. He wanted to hurt a kid in school. You are civilians right now. We know Hiroshima. What do you mean? What do you mean? Don't fuck with me right now, bro see that other people were made very uncomfortable around this and that's whenever i started trying to like really kind of mask my emotions and how i felt about things because it was very evident to me that i was not really normal and uh this has been a no such thing as normal it's a construct again a huge problem my whole life but that was pretty much the first at least the time that i can remember in my mind uh the first time that i can remember that and see that wow this is this didn't go over the way that I thought it would go over because I was so happy and nobody else is happy and they think I'm like a bad person. But it's like, you know, from my perspective, that's not how I saw it. And, uh, you know, from my perspective, rip bozo. So um, this is a big problem. And uh, this happens in middle school as well. I cared a lot about like how I looked, how I dressed, et cetera, in middle school. Uh, I mean, really, who doesn't? And, uh, you know, I really tried to, to, you know, like take myself seriously. And, you know, I tried to have a good impression, et cetera, do the right things, say the right things, wear the right things, uh, be the right kind of person. And uh, going into high school, I kind of got, uh, there's a weird thing where like, I, I ended up going to like one high school uh, that I didn't want to go to. And then I ended up going to another high school after that, after I told my parents that if they didn't change me over, I would myself and fail every single class. As one does. Which to be halfway, I was halfway, uh, halfway followed through with that because my first semester in that high school, I had a GPA of a point zero eight. It was actually impressive. It was hard to do. I had to, I had to go out of my way for this. And so uh, then I ended up getting transferred over, and I went to the the school where my friends were. And I think that like the high school that I had originally gone to was uh, a much more superficial, much more like you know, like a higher class high school because my dad wanted me to go there because you know like he wanted me to go to school to get an education. Imagine that. I wanted to go to school to hang out with my friends. So there was a bit of a disconnect there. And so um, I go over to the other school and I realized that uh, I need to stop caring about what people think about me because I saw the people that were in that other school and I realized that's not the kind of person that I wanted to be. Okay, love this. So he was in one school with a bunch of like, let's say kids who were going to go on to do something in the, you know, were educated, were networking kind of bubble. Then he went to the less that bubble and realized I don't, looking back at the bubble I was just in, I don't want to be that bubble. That's what I say. Like, do you know who you are in the story? Asmin is having that realization in high school going, I don't want to be that. What do I have to do to not be that? Okay, I can't care what people think about me. So he went from being in one bubble to another bubble, had a realization and implemented that realization. Yeah? Very, very good. Very interesting because they were the more extreme version of the person that I was trying to be. And at that point, I realized that I didn't really want to be like other people. And I had to develop, I guess, my own identity. And this was at like, I would say 14 or 15. And that happened and that continued all the way through high school. And, you know, I, I was always like, a, you know, I never really had a girlfriend, right, in high school or anything like that. Maybe, you know, I talked to a girl, but not, not really, okay? And so I was never really treated very well by, uh, you know, a lot of girls or anything like that. And uh, big surprise, imagine that. And so uh, anyway, uh, this happened and, you know, I, I kind of got used to this and it was normal. So I would try to improve myself and, you know, like make myself look better and try to do this. And it would just be met with the same outcome, which was a, a massive failure. Big surprise. Um, you know, uh, being a level 60 warrior isn't as attractive to women as it is to other 16 year old guys. So when he says this is how I'm hearing it, when he says big surprise, he's saying and he's kind of I think he's subtly like explaining this to his audience you can't be surprised when a girl doesn't like you because you're level 60 and was it war? Wow. Okay. Not my bubble. Okay. You got to understand, like, of course they don't like you because you're not translating. You're not communicating to them clearly. He's not blaming anybody. He's not pointing fingers. He's not saying these women suck. I never had a, a girlfriend. He's saying, oh yeah, of course I never had a girlfriend. Why would I have had a girlfriend when I wasn't connecting with women for the right reasons or girls with the right reasons? Like Aspen does this thing where he talks about how hard his life is, but never blames anyone for it. And that's interesting. 
it's, it's going to get worse. He had a rough childhood, so he's going to talk about it. But that's the thing about Asmin that sticks out to me. He is very good at not blaming other people for his problems. He just does something about it instead. And that is so specifically brained. And so anyway, uh, I, I had this happen and, uh, you know, I, I eventually kind of got to the point where I was more comfortable with that and I stopped really caring as much about what, you know, like people would think about me and, you know, in general, just like people's perception of me. And uh, this kind of got worse as time goes on. And uh, I think that I spent like my teenage years primarily trying to disconnect myself and trying to remove myself from the obligation to be a certain kind of person to the public and uh, just to society in general. Uh, I, I viewed society as, uh, you know, I, I, I never I never chose to be here. This was not up for discussion. Uh, I just spawned in here. And so it's like, I have to follow these rules. I have to do all these things. I have to be this kind of a person. And then, you know, when I was like age 17, 18, 19. I asked myself, well, why am I doing this? And so I, I stopped doing all of that stuff. And uh, I've done many degenerate things. Things, none of which I regret. None of See? Okay. So then he does. I didn't choose to be here. I just spawned in this game. Why am I doing this? And that's kind of, that's what I think we're all, we all are. I think all of us are just evolved animals on a planet. So we're here the same way a tree is here. And we didn't have a choice to be here. So then we have to make, like, do our best. Like I wake up and I do what I want every day. Like I do what I want every day. And I made a life where that's possible. And I think that that is the greatest gift I could ever give myself is to be able to do what I want every day. And that is a gift I would cry in my room and self-harm over when I was younger. Like I would literally be harming and being like, I am so miserable existing. Why the fuck am I here? What am I doing here? This is misery. I am so over it. I don't want to be here. And the truth is, is like, I just didn't want to be around people because people are uh, frustrating but I like myself. I want to be alone with myself. I want to mind my own business. I want to do my stuff. I like my hobbies. I like my pastime. And I think Asmin is sort of like kind of conveying this very, again, everyone always, always like thought, oh, Brittany's so interesting. Brittany does whatever she wants, but it's also Brittany. You can't just do whatever you want. And I'm like, yes, I can. You're just kind of envious that you can't figure out how to do whatever you want. And I get that. That must be frustrating. You should probably start with not blaming the world for your position in life because that's what I did. Once I stopped blaming the world for the reason my life was miserable, I learned that I was the only reason my life was miserable. And then now I have the perfect life. That was my lived experience. It could be yours. Maybe not. There's a billion people on the planet. Maybe it doesn't work for you. But for me, that's what I see in Asmin is I see that he doesn't blame other people. He just goes, okay, what are the rules of the game? All right, I'm going to beat the game. And that is like what I've said for years on this channel, right? Is I don't care what the game is. I just want to know the rules so I can beat it. And usually, even as a child, let's say, what are the consequences for leaving the house in the middle of the night? What's the grounding consequence? My parents would say, these are the consequences. And I'd say, okay, is that worth me breaking the rules for the consequence and that I would make the decision. I make the decision in social situations all the time. Like if I do this, what's the social expectation? What are the consequences to doing this? What are other people going to do to me if I do this thing I want to do? And most of that stuff that I want to do has nothing to do with other people. I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to bother you. I just want to dress how I want to dress, live how I live, mind my business, eat my food, watch my anime. You know what I'm saying? And that is so painful for people. How dare you want to watch whatever anime you want? You can't just sit at home and watch Netflix all day. Why not, girl? Why not? As long as I'm working, paying my tax and doing my due diligence, why the fuck not? Is that not a dream for you? So again, I think for me, the video resonated so much in this regard where I'm like, yeah, it's so funny how people want to be in a life where they're free, but then get mad when they see other people attain it because they think, oh, you got there because you're, you know, whatever. They create some narrative around why you got there and why they didn't. Not nothing at all in my life that I've ever regretted at all. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I would do things that a lot of people would consider to be very uh, improper. Uh, let's just say that. And so, so um, I never really viewed myself, I, I never really viewed it as like a good or a bad thing. I just, you know, simply existed and I did what I would do. And that was it. And at that point, I pretty much had completely disconnected myself from the perception of other people. And this was at the same time, like growing up, uh, my mom... Now, the question is, did he swing too far in the other direction? Was he in one direction where he's like, I care about what people think? And did he swing too far in the other direction, which is why he lives the way he lives? My theory is yes. But let's watch the rest of the video because my theory about Asmin, my theory about Asmin is that he, are you ready? I think he's a three. I think he's a three or he's a really good four who hides it. But I think he's a three 
who realize there's something more than the bubbles, but not enough to pop them all in a real way. And I think instead what he did is he just went to the very extreme of not caring to the point where he doesn't shower and he has a house that's disgusting, but he's working on it. And it feels like, oh, almost like a rebellious. It's almost like he practiced Buddhism Buddhism, and like did like non-attachment, but then he became attached to being non-attached, which is a conundrum people fall into on the introspective journey. They think being unattached is being so unattached, you don't care about anything, but that's not what it's about. It's about being unattached is about accepting what is yours and what isn't yours. And the yours that is yours isn't even yours. But it's not about, you know, I'm not going to shower for a month because I don't care about anything. Though I would say that his aversion to water is probably autistic. Like, that's why I think his sensory issues around water and textures and vegetables, I just think it's aut autism. I do. was, uh, I, I think there was maybe two years or so where she made above the poverty level in terms of income. And so we basically barely skated by most of the time. So his parents are divorced. His dad is business educated and made money, pay child support. His mom uh, had a job, but was living under the poverty line basically most of the time. So there was, he grew up struggling. And primarily the reason for that, honestly, is because my dad, uh, my dad always paid child support, etc. at least until I was 18. And, um, you know, all that time, you know, she was able to skate by with that and pretty much survive. Uh, after uh, high school was over, uh, then obviously like that stopped and then she wasn't able to support herself. So I was having to figure out ways to make money and try to like, piece together money. She would borrow money sometimes from my dad. And it was in general like a very, very negative situation. And so we never really had any money. Uh, this was the time where, uh, you know, I... And listen to the way he talks about it. Just matter of fact, it was a negative situation. Asmund really loved his mom. I think that's important to state is Asmund really loved his mom. And his mom, obviously, this is the house his mom was in. And a lot of the same stuff that are in the house is also from, I think, his mom. And so, you know, Asmund grew up with a mom who contributed. She was honestly, she played WoW as well. And she struggled to work. Autism is genetic. So I'm just saying, like, I feel like his mom was probably, I feel like the house is a very neurodivergent house. When I see very cluttered homes, I automatically do think neurodivergence in the same way that if I see a really pristine home, I'm like neurodivergence. It's too in the extreme. It's just too extreme. And neurodivergency is, does experience extreme, like a formula, a pattern I'm seeing, but I don't know. I was pretty much, uh, ironically, at the peak of my degener degeneracy. I was probably one of the highest rated uh, warriors. And wow, uh, at the time, it was great, but uh, not necessarily in real life. And so at this point, I had pretty much completely disconnected myself from uh, the way that people saw me. And I stopped caring about the way that people saw me because I pretty much gave up on being like a normal person. I gave up on being uh, accepted by the public. I gave up on living a normal life or, you know, having a family or anything like that. I just felt like I just was not capable of that based off of my experiences that I had. And I, I had many other ones too. Like I stabbed somebody and a few other things too. I, I probably wouldn't even say because they would too drastically alter people's perception of me. Uh, but either way, uh, you know, a lot of these instances where I kind of was like, okay, this is, this is bad. Maybe it's better that I'm, uh, you know, quarantined in my house. And so anyway, uh, I did this a lot. And uh, my mom and I, like, it was really just kind of the two of us. Uh, my dad was there. He was supportive and he always has been supportive. But other than that, uh, I do have family, uh, but none of them live in the state of Texas. And so mm. uh, any trouble, any problems, anything like that. It was pretty much entirely on me uh, to resolve this issue. And so take care of my mom, pay for things, anything like that. It was always on me. And uh, her health started deteriorating uh, at about the same time. Uh, this is big surprise. Uh, you smoke since you're 16. You spend your entire time smoking cigarettes, watching, watching ancient aliens, and around on the internet playing WoW, and you're overweight massively like she was. Uh, this isn't good for your health, especially when you're getting into your 60s. See how he's very matter of fact? Like, oh, wow, big surprise. You've smoked your whole life and you're overweight. And of course, your health is declining. And like, I think that's really valid. I think like it's a radical acceptance of like, yeah, of course, you're going to die. That's why I tell you, like, at the end of the day, like, I'm not going to be surprised when I get a phone call about certain people in my life because I'm like, yeah, that was the life you were living. Your probability of dying was pretty high. I love you. I hope you're happy with the way you lived your life. But also dying isn't the worst thing ever. We all have to do it. We all have to do it, kids, you know? 
which she was at that time because she had me when she was like 39 and a half or 40 or something. And so at this point, uh, you know, her health was deteriorating. And I remember like she had like a number of instances where like I would uh, I would like wake up and I hear her like screaming because she like she would like I don't, I don't even really know what the f was wrong with her. I, I don't know. It was like a uh, like a weird thing where like she couldn't see out of her eye. And then she had like some kind of like I think like a bleed in her eye. And then uh, she had like I think they it wasn't really a heart attack. It was like some sort of like variation of that. And I remember like her like begging me not to call the ambulance. And this is just like and this is at the same time that, uh, you know, the house is and, you know, we can barely pay for the house. We're worried about getting evicted from the house. Uh, we have no uh, no AC. Or no, we did have AC. We didn't have heat. And so, uh, you know, I would go to sleep and, like, the house would be so cold because I would just give her the heater. And I always viewed it as, like, you know, oh, I'm sleeping out on Mount Everest, right? It's like, you know, I'm cosplaying as Bear Grylls. And I remember, like, my glass of water in my, uh, in my room, they would have, like, ice crystals on the edge of it, right? Because of how cold it was. And See, this is a very specific existence. This is why asthma, I think, is so relatable to so many people because a lot more Americans are living this lifestyle than the one that, like, I lived in middle America, California, or not middle America, like, um, West Coast America, where we, we, I never had this growing up. My, you know what I mean? Even in 2008, when my parents were struggling and there was no income for a few years, you know, the housing crisis was happening. Like, we, as kids, my parents didn't, have it impact us. We never had to, I never had, let me speak for myself. I never had to, as a child, I have no memory of ever having to like think about my parents in that regard. I felt like they took care of it, even if it was them going into major debt. And now they're, you know, house is paid off. Everything's good. But it's one of those things where as men is as a child or as a young adult, actively thinking about his parent, actively thinking about the struggles, actively like this is a stress on a child that's specific. And even to be like him, like to be aware of it is a very specific burden. Not everyone's going to have this experience, but it makes Asmund much more lovable too to his audience. If you guys don't know anything about Asmund, he's so rich. He's got a lot of money. Okay. He makes a lot of money every month on YouTube. He kills it. But He's also really balanced with how he makes money, like his Twitch channel on uh, Twitch, his secondary channel where he streams from isn't even monetized. They might force him to monetize it because it costs them money, but he's like, I don't really need to make more money. But at the same time, he won't demonize, demonize business makers. He'll say, if you're a business, you should make money. He'll sound like really conservative and you might be like, oh, he's just money hungry. But then when you find out that he is not monetizing a channel that gets 20,000 viewers a stream when he's streaming for free like that's a crazy realization like this is where i'm like very impressed by him in a way but then he's single he has no kids he has a paid off house like his it's the house he grew up in from his mom he's not worried about he's got enough money to last a single guy a lifetime right and he doesn't care about money after when he dies he doesn't care where the money goes because he's like i'm gonna be dead i don't care and i think that's the difference so for me, that's really impressive. Now, if you had a family or kids, I'd be like, you should be saving that money for those, you know, should make more money for your kids. But at the same time, like, the, these are the good things about Asmin. Regardless of when I disagree with him or when I think like, uh, that's like a different bubble take, I appreciate that energy from him. I think it's because he watched his mom struggle and he struggled. And I think he's just kind of, I think this is endearing is what I'm trying to say. And so I did that really for like two years. And so we had like basically like zero money. And so uh, this happened and uh, pretty much like her health would deteriorate more and more and more to the point where she couldn't drive. She couldn't do X. She couldn't do Y. She couldn't get a job anymore. And then it relied on me more and more to completely support her in like pretty much all ways. And so and I remember she would like beg. like She was like on the ground, like crying, uh, begging me not to call an ambulance. And so this uh, was very upsetting for me, by the way. Uh, like I, I got to the point where like at this time period, I would wake up like every two hours or so with like. Uh, like a weird thing where I would hear her screaming my name and this went on for maybe like six months to a year and uh, and also I want to say that like all of this stuff and everything about it uh, I don't really like everybody in life has problems and I hope that by sharing my problems people can kind of see where I'm coming from as a person I don't really care about sympathy I don't care about people feeling bad for me I don't really give a fuck I agree I think his the way he's explaining the story is very matter of fact I don't think he's trying to garner sympathy I think he's just trying to say like, you never know someone's story because it's easy to look at Asmin and say, like, oh, you're just gross. You're filthy. Look at this house. Or it's easy to look at him and say, like, you're rich. Like, you're just money hungry. But this is a, in my opinion, this is childhood trauma. Like, this is trauma. You know, this is a lot of work. Like, 
This is a lot to be a caregiver, to take on the responsibility, the burden of taking care of your adult parent. Like all of that is a very intense situation. And he obviously loved his mom so much. Like it's so obvious that Asbin loved his mom, bro. And it breaks my heart because like that's so painful, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I believe him. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, so I, I hope that nobody thinks that this is coming off as any form of a, uh, you know, like sympathy play. Uh, you know, I've had things bad happen in my life. I think that in many cases they've been my fault. I've deserved them. Uh, but this is just what's happened. And so anyway, uh, and, and every every action and every outcome in my life leading up to now has led me to the position that I am right now. And I think that in a lot of cases I'm happy with how I am. Mm -hmm. And you can't just go back and edit out all the bad parts and expect to be in the good part. True. I agree too. I know I don't regret my past because I really appreciate my present. But I think it's really hard to imagine that could be true until you get there. Because, you know, when you're in the bad, you just wish, oh, I regret that. Take it back. But to be honest, like, no regrets. Really happy with where I ended up. But yeah, I, I, I think he's being really honest here. And so at the same time this was happening, like a lot of my friends were obviously going through college, finishing college, uh, you know, having girlfriends, like moving in and everything. And I was worried about, uh, you know, number one, my mom dying. Number two, um, uh, my, uh, you know, m being homeless. And number three, uh, at that point, uh, I had always assumed that I would kill myself after high school. Like, sure. That was my plan. Yep. Watch my podcast on my unaliving age, which was 35, just came by, just passed by. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Wrath of Lich King came out and I just got distracted. I, I forgot. And so <laughs> I forgot to kill myself. A video game came out. I think what's funny about this is that I didn't invest in a lot in my future because I thought I was going to myself. I just didn't. I was like, well, why do I need to save for a house or save my money or do anything when I'm going to die at 35 anyways? And then I reached 30 and I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to die. Am I? Oh, I'm going to live. I'm going to live this life. I want to live. And then I was like, okay. And then at 30, I was like, all right, let's go. We're taking it seriously now. That's why it always makes me laugh when people who don't want to themselves live the most like trapped life. I'm like, bro, you don't even want to and you're like living a living like why are I don't even get it. But maybe it's the fact that I was like, I'll just un myself that made me actually reach my dreams because I knew I could just take myself out. And then I was like, all right, well, instead of taking myself out, I should just probably live the life I want first. And then I did it. And I was like, oh, it's kind of nice, you know, but it takes a lot of work and you still work for the rest of your life. Like you don't stop working for the life you want. Wait, he's joking, but that's so real. I'm not dying because I'm waiting for the next season of anime. Oh, I don't know if he's joking. I think it's true because the truth is, is like that reason alone could be the reason you stay alive because it might just be worth it. And let me tell you, this is why I laugh at people. They're like, Brittany says she's evil. And like Brittany, Brittany's probably a bad person. Brittany just wants to watch her anime and I will un myself if you force me to be in an existence where you think I'm a bad person because I just want to watch anime. I literally just want to eat food, watch anime, and stream. And the audacity of these people on the internet that are so obviously in their evil to look at me and say, Brittany's a bad person. Girl, please look in the mirror and leave me alone, girl. But also thank you for the views, girl. And like, it's one of those things where I'm like, girl, we point fingers at the people, and this is such a neurodivergent thing to think that I could be a bad person because I just want to eat food and watch anime. Isn't that so funny? Like as a young person, I just thought being gay was enough. Like I'm such a bad person, I'm gay. It's like, girl, get over it. The world does not care that you're gay. Actually, let me rephrase. Mother nature doesn't care that you're gay. People might, but people are stupid. Don't listen to them, okay? The world is too stupid to listen to it. I'm sorry. The world is so miserable. Don't listen to miserable people tell you about life. Listen to people that got their dreams or that like accomplished their goals. And as somebody who's accomplished her goals, so much better than dying. But also, the only reason I ever wanted to die was because of other people. It was never because of me. So I uh, ended up not doing that. And uh, because of that, I never brushed my teeth in high school. Never really gave a fuck about it. Never cared. And this caused, guess what that, guess what that caused? Uh, see, he never brushed his teeth and I never saved money. He, I thought I was going to die, so I never saved any money. He thought he was, he was like gonna die, so he never brushed his teeth. Uh, it causes your teeth to rot out. And so a lot of my teeth had to be, uh, you know, I had to get fillings and everything as a, as a teenager. And uh, my dad paid for a lot of it, which he was very, very unhappy about. And so these fillings would come out. This is what happens. Ah, uh, Chad brought up nihilism. Okay, I am not a nihilist. I think nihilis nihilists are, a two nihilists versus four nihilists is like a distinction I make. I think two nihilists are kind of in denial but they're not really understanding the full picture. It's kind of a cope. But is Asmin like a two nihilist or like a three nihilist? Or, cause I don't think he's a four. I think he's like, I think it's, a, I think nihilism is playing a part, but I think 
because of the state of his house. I know this sounds really weird, but the state of how he lives is somewhat of the indicator to me that he hasn't really unlocked all the layers of his consciousness, but he might not have to, to be happy, but I think to be joyful. And I don't think Asmund's joyful yet. And joyful is very specific. And I, I'm rooting for Asmund. I think he would have to unlock that sort of like nothing matters and actually get to the other side of it. Because I think two nihilists are like, nothing matters, not going to brush my teeth. And that's great. But also, what if nothing matters, I'm going to brush my teeth. You know, I feel like the, you know what I'm saying? But also brushing your teeth is really hard as a neurodivergent person. I have to have special toothpaste. I sing myself songs. I play certain videos. I like distract myself so I don't realize I'm brushing my teeth. One of the reasons uh, an autistic friend of mine was like, go get tested, girl. Go get tested. And I was like, <laughs> okay. With fillings or anything like that. And they did come out. And then, of course, my teeth deteriorated naturally because I love soda. I love drinking soda. I've got a soda right over there. Went to McDonald's earlier today. Really, really like soda. Like it so much that right now uh, I only have five real teeth left in my whole mouth. Wow. And uh, I think you start with like 32, which is kind of crazy to think. And so anyway, um, this happened. Yes, I love this. Purpose has to be unlocked. Yes, Purpose has to be unlocked. And I don't think he's unlocked that purpose yet. But I, I think that he he's so close to it, which is kind of amazing. He doesn't have to do it, of course. But I, yeah, I think it's interesting. Like this video was really a good eye-opener to where he is in his life right now. And I'm really rooting. I'm very team Asmin rooting for him to be a successful as I root for every but I root for everybody. So, you know. And uh, all my teeth were starting to rot out. I was not able to eat with one side of my mouth. I would have these toothaches that would get so bad that I would pass out from the pain. And I eventually had to go to like the, uh, like basically, uh, if, if you're like, the people that really get by medical bills are the people that are in the middle of like, uh, you know, economically. True. Because if you're broke, like they'll do for you for like ten dollars so they can get anything they'll do it and so i had a program like that and so they would have to pull out my teeth kind of regularly and uh that's how i lost i have no back teeth at all that's why uh if you look at my jawline uh it's very different than if you look at it uh from like you know high school or like uh, by the age of like uh, 19 or 20. uh it's completely changed because i've lost all of my teeth and my jaw uh bone is like pretty much rotted out and so, which I, as far as I know is, is unfixable, at least in, in the, the way that I have this problem. Uh, I, there, there's a separate problem that is fixable. I don't have that one. I talked to a dentist about it. Mm. So it's, it's basically like irreversibly. And so anyway, uh, this happened. And um, you know, what's interesting is I see a lot of those videos on TikTok of people who grew up not going to the dentist and just eating sugar, 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 sugar. And yeah, their teeth rot out. And I will say, cause I asked my partner, I was like, wait, some of my brothers, are literally like grew up their whole life without brushing their teeth because like you know they just wet the toothbrush and pretend they brushed their teeth which is like i get it kids but i'm like why are their teeth rotted and to be honest my parents didn't have soda in the house we didn't have sugar in the house like my siblings and i didn't grow up eating a lot of sugar at all and i wonder if that is why some of their teeth didn't rot because like i don't drink soda ever like i never drink it. i don't like the way it tastes i don't like the way it feels on my teeth I don't drink it ever. And I don't drink juices. I don't drink anything. I just drink water, tea, and coffee. Those are my three favorite things. And I put honey in my coffee. Um, I don't even use like white sugar. And so I don't know. It's so interesting. Sort of like the rotting of teeth is such an interesting journey, you know? It was not a great time. Uh, my teeth were rotting out, etc. And at that point, I had to completely, like, pretty much give up the notion and give up the uh, dream of ever being a normal person at that point. I, I mm. could feel myself. Normal person, normal person, normal person. It's such an interesting idea. What is a normal person as if it exists? Uh, no longer. The world is built off of a facade of a normal person, but it really isn't that it's normal. It's just that it's almost like the dream of what they want people to be. You know, that's my theory. My theory is like society is built off of like a hope of what they want the society to be, but not a realistic reflection of the people. And people are in denial. Like Asmin, of course, had to have this job, right? Doesn't it make sense that I'm a streamer, he's a streamer? Like we spend our time on the internet because like I got burnt out doing a nine to five. I got burnt out trying to work two to three jobs. I was like, I couldn't do it. And he says that later in the video, he'll talk about trying to get a normal job and how like it just doesn't work out for him. You know, being uh, the same as anybody else, right? And uh, 
I, I, I actually, for a while, I, I really hated it, but then I got used to it, and then uh, I, that, then I, I embraced it, and I think that's that's where I am now. So I would say like that was from like ages, like I would say you know thirteen uh, to I don't know like twenty one somewhere around there, right? Uh, then after that. Uh, I started. Uh, I started doing other stuff. I was playing WoW. I was making videos. I was doing other random things, right? And uh, my mom's like health pretty much would always get worse, and that's just you know that's just the way it is when you get older, right? And so I would have to do my best to like take care of her and uh, worked at the IRS for a while. I uh, tried to work. At oh wait! Shout out to Ko and Chad who says I only drink cold water. I hate it when it's warm. I hate it when it's warm. You know how I drink out of these mason jars? I keep one. I keep two in the fridge, and I switch them out. So one is always freezing cold for me, no matter what, because I do not like warm water. If I drink warm water, I feel like I didn't hydrate. I, it has to be cold. I put everything in the freezer, cookies, chocolate, anything I like to eat. I like it freezing cold. Cheese, salami. If it's not cold, doesn't not frozen, but if it's not cold, I won't eat it. Even in the winter, especially in the winter, I like it cold, 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 cold. And water only in glass. I can't drink out of plastic. I can't drink out of plastic cups. Yeah, I can't drink. I can't drink out of plastic cups. I think it, it tastes weird. I can only drink out of glass. Sam's Club didn't really go very well, uh, but overall. Okay, so wait, rewind that. He said he tried to work at Sam's Club. Worked at the IRS for a while. Uh, tried to work at Sam's Club. Didn't really go very well. Uh, but overall, I uh, you know tried he to only worked at them. I think for a few months at a time. I don't remember, and I think that is so. Interesting. Go back to college. I, I do have a college degree, if you can imagine. He has a college degree. I didn't know this about Asmin, that he has a college degree. That's kind of amazing. He's a streamer, but, you know, I'm sure he uses it in his business. But uh, learned more from business from WoW than I did from business school. And so I learned more from business in WoW than I did from business school. His dad is a business person, so I think he had high aspirations for Asmin. So Asmin got that degree but then became a streamer. Now his dad did support his streaming career as far as I know, his dad shows up on stream sometimes. And just like my parents, I think my parents supported me. My parents always supported my YouTube career. Like it was partially my, it was really my dad's idea, honestly. Like I wanted to be a radio person. He's like, you should be a YouTuber. And I was like, okay. And like, he was right. It was a good decision to make. Um, Cause radio people have to work with other people. I have to go into the office. I'm not gonna do that. And my dad always said, Batsy, you're gonna have to work for yourself. I know you. My dad called it. My dad was like, you cannot work for other people. I know you. Even though I worked for other people mostly my whole life, he knew I was going to have my own business, just like him. He knew. So Asmin's dad has been supportive and his mom was supportive. And I think that's like a key like key reason why Asmin's also well-adjusted, even though his parents are divorced and there's some trauma there, obviously. He also had parents who loved him individually. So uh, then I, I spent that time and then this was all the time, like, you know, me not knowing if she would, you know, every day I would wake up and like, you know, hear that voice in my mind. And like, you know, it was really, really bad. And uh, mm. this is just something I would do all the time. And I try to always make the best out of things. I try to just, you know, not think about it. But, uh, you know, looking back on it, things were very, very bad. And so anyway, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit later. And that's whenever I was like going back to uh, going back to college. I, um, I thought that I would just, you know, basically have a job, play video games for my whole life and then die. Right. Great. And then I got a job and i realized the job is actually a lot more than i thought it would be mm -hmm. so then i remember it was probably like one of the best things that ever happened to me is that uh i i took this job at sam's club and i hated it so much it actually encouraged me to make myself a better person if you can imagine that yes i can imagine that relatable bro and so uh, I, I signed up to go back to university and finish another degree that I was working on so I could go to law school. Actually, I wanted to be a lawyer, um, basically because I, I had a friend in high school. We would always play Magic the Gathering, and I could see him. He would always manipulate the rules to come out ahead and win different like arguments in Magic the Gathering. And I was like, hmm, I bet lawyers do that in real life. I should do that myself. And so that was always my motivation. And uh, anyway, I, I did that. And uh, then, you know, a number of other things, you know, random things that are not, you know, I would say like YouTube or public uh, safe uh, that I did. And um, then after that, I uh, started doing YouTube. And then I started doing YouTube and I, I focused on that. And I would put videos out of the way that I lived, etc. And uh, people would always find it to be very funny or like weird. And everybody would like really, like there were a lot of people, and, and this is true even now, uh, people that like hate me for living the way that I do. And I think that really, um, you know, people look at a person like me and they see a person who has a number of things in their life that they wish they had, but I've done basically you know, if you look at it from like, what do they tell you to do when you're growing up? Uh, you know, I used every single thing to do as a checklist of what not to do, right? And so, uh, you know, I think that a lot of people could be a little bit- uh But they can't do it. 
This is a little bit of the difference. And I think Asmin had a pretty good opinion about the Hassan. You know, Abba Preach, Hassan, me, we all talked about the idea that streaming is a hard job. It's like socially draining on your spoons. I can't stream every day for 10 hours like these guys can. I can't do it. It's, it makes me want to die because I'm so hurt. I'm in so much pain. My body is in so much pain. The reason I get up and take breaks is because I have to move. My body's in too much pain to sit for very long. And so I have to get up and move. Like these guys are dealing on a different wavelength. Some of them do just like drink Coke all day and energy drinks and stuff like that to get by. I don't do any of those things. So, you know, I'm never going to be able to compete with that kind of a schedule. But I will say, Abba said this to me when we talked about it. He said, you know, the job itself is like kind of easy, but then you have these things that make it harder, which I agree with. The job itself is really simple. You get on, you entertain, you get off. But making a living doing it is very difficult. You know, it's not as easy as guaranteed paycheck. Like the gov, like these businesses have to pay you for your time. You you exchange time for money. That's very different than you work and hope to get paid. And I think that's the struggle. Now, in Abba's defense, he was talking about as uh, Hassan, who has like millions of dollars. So fair. He makes like three million a year, I think. Valid. Like, I get it. But as like a middle class YouTuber, you know, I'm still making more money than the average person. But who I'm really competing against is myself. I'm never thinking about what other people are doing. I'm thinking about 25 year old Brittany working three jobs, making $700 a week and thinking I was rich. That's who I am competing with. And I say, Brittany, I remember when I was making $700 a week and I was like, holy f I'm a millionaire, dude. I make so much money. I just remember thinking I am f rich. And then, cause I was making 200 before that. When I was making 200 a week, I was like, Jesus, this is hard. Then I was making 300. Then I was making 700 a week. And I was like, holy f And this was working three jobs, by the way. I always worked. I worked, I worked, I worked. And then what I transferred, when I replaced that income with YouTube, I was like, okay, I can do YouTube now. Because once I took my minimum wage income that I was working on my nine to fives or whatever, it wasn't really minimum wage, but you know, whatever it was. And I replaced it with YouTube. I was like, I'm doing YouTube because this is the easiest job I've had. But at the same time, it's like an everyday hustle. But like, these are the, you know, these are the things that really move on your path of joy for other people. That's not what they want. They don't want to be a streamer. They just want money. Okay, girl, we all want money, girl. But that's not how life works. You don't just like get money. Asman doesn't just get money. His story resonated with people. People related to him. People, he was, he was online for so long, people got to know him and he went viral so many times. A lot of good people found him and they resonated with him. And so I think that's kind of the key. So where are you in the story? Who are you? And then what game are you gonna play to actually have it so you wake up every day and you go to bed every day happy? Like joyful, like excited. Like today was a great day. Can't wait for tomorrow. How do you get to that point? I can't tell you how to do it because your life is specific to you, but I know how I did it and it was not easy. Um, you know, annoyed by that. And so I, I can see why and et cetera. And, and it is disgusting by the way. And so, uh, you know, missing half your teeth and, uh, you know, living uh, in a dump uh, with a dead rat alarm clock. You don't know if your mom's gonna be alive that day. Uh, you've got no money, you have to support her. She's never gonna be able to support herself. Uh, and things are just basically slowly getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, I started doing YouTube and things started doing a little bit better. I started doing streaming, things were doing better then. Uh, I went to uh, get my teeth fixed because if you look at my old videos, a lot of my old videos, you'd notice that I smile, you know, when I smile, I cover my mouth and I smile. Uh, the reason for that is this isn't Saikuno where I, I don't like my smile. Yeah, well, I don't like my smile. It's not because I think it's ugly, it's because I didn't have any fucking teeth. Mm -hmm. I didn't want people to see that. And so uh, that's why I would cover my mouth a lot whenever I first started streaming. And so uh, this happened to me uh, for a long time. I, they finally, I go to, I go to go to the dentist and they tell me it's going to be like around uh, $50,000 to get all my teeth fixed and everything. Ooh, $50,000. <gasps> oh my God. Era. Um, then I thought, hmm, maybe because it was the first time at that point where I, I kind of like it really hit me that I had like irreversibly and irreparably damaged my life in a way that I couldn't just immediately like undo. Because like as a kid, you know, usually you make a mistake where it's like you scrape your knee and then, well, you put a bandage on and it gets better. But with this, it never was going to get better and it's only going to get worse. And it certainly has, by the way. And so anyway, uh, I, I did want to kill myself, but I decided instead of if I do something even worse, I'd start streaming. And based. Uh, I started streaming because I wasn't really making enough money. And everybody says, oh, well, I started streaming because, you know, I like interacting with people. It's because I was lonely. Well, I, I started streaming for money. I needed some f 
money. And so that's what mm -hmm. I did. And I was like, guys, we've got a donation goal of $100. And, you know, if we get $100, I'm going to go to Wendy's tomorrow. And I would always meme it up. You know, $1 equals one donut. And it's like, you know, I would make a bunch of money. And it was great. And, and things actually did go very well. I, I streamed every single night. I was very dedicated. I tried to make things as entertaining as possible. And, uh, you know, I did what I tried to do best, right? And um, things kind of got better and they improved. Okay, just to give you guys a contrast, because he said 50K to fix all his teeth. When I was in Arizona before I left... They quoted me $3,000 to fill in my cavities to do all my fillings and stuff. $3,000. And I was like, who has $3,000 just laying around, bros? I was like, I don't have $3,000. I was like, you're crazy. I waited. My partner told me to wait till I came to Croatia. We went to a private dentist in Croatia, so not even on the health insurance. Went to a private dentist. It was less than $500. Well, 500 euro. Bro, crazy. Uh, this happened uh, just at pretty much the same time. A lot of my friends were kind of evolving and going past, you know, uh, you know, like college, like they were getting careers, getting married, having kids. And like now I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, I'm thinking to myself, I'm pretty sure every single friend that I have is either married or has a kid. Uh, which is kind of crazy mm. considering that uh you know I'm, I'm sitting here doing doing what i'm doing but it is kind of weird i'm, I'm 34 now which is um honestly a f***ing shock like mm. i i can't believe it i don't feel 34 i feel like i'm still 16 but uh, mm, you remember when i made that video i think it's private now probably but like what what's the real age i feel i i feel 35 with the I feel 16 with a 35 year old's money i kind of just feel like millennials and neurodivergent millennials especially genuinely this is how i feel not literally about every single one just about my category and asmins we want to do what we want to do every day and it's certainly not running a country so of course we use our money to kind of have that dream life we wanted almost like as a kid a little bit we're just like anime hanging out with friends doing what you want to do and so like i kind of feel like a 35 year old with a 35 year old's money but like I don't really feel 16, but like I feel like an adult who just does what she wants every day, which is sort of like a kid. The responsibility I have is really just about myself and my partner and my cat. Like I have responsibilities to my family, but they're very laid back. I'm not obvious. You know what I mean? So it's very different. I don't know something about it, but I'm still paying tax. So f you guys. OK, that's as adult as I need to be. Uh, I look in the mirror, I see my hairline, and I think to myself, oh my god, wait a minute, I think I'm actually 34. And if I'm really not sure, I talk to somebody who's 16, and then I realize, hold up, wait a minute, no, actually I am 34. Because that there's no better way to realize that you're actually older until you talk to somebody who's actually younger. At least yep. it is for me. True. So anyway. Um, That's why it's so weird when people date like really young people. Because I'm like, don't you feel like old compared to them? Don't you feel like so weird like with young people? I don't know. You know, my stream was doing very well. Uh, my social life really, I, I pretty much like stopped interacting with a lot of friends of mine because I focused pretty much just on streaming and on making this as much as possible. And also, I and that's honestly, that's the hardest part of streaming is anytime you're building a business, especially from scratch, anytime you're doing it, it's all about your time and hopes to make money. So you kind of have to like isolate into the streaming bubble or into the content bubble. And then you have to really balance work and life because it's hard. Like you guys know, I'm in my hustle era. That's what I'm calling it where I'm very much focused on the work and this thing that I'm doing here because I'm thinking about retirement. I think a lot of people also get into content creation and don't think about retirement. That's why Fusi lost $7 million because he wasn't thinking about retirement. But also, what are these people ever thinking? Gabby Hanna and Fusi and all those people. See, they're the other part of YouTube that didn't stay grounded. I would rather be Asmin who lives in a filthy house than Fusi or Gabby who lost millions of dollars and is just like manic people on the internet. You know what I mean? Like, I'd rather the groundedness. There's, you know what I'm saying? I'm a very introverted person in a lot of ways. I like being alone. I don't like people talking to me a whole lot. I don't like phone calls. I don't like interacting with people. I don't mm -hmm. like going out. Uh, you guys might notice this, right? If it's, you know, a mystery or secret. And so, um, you know, big surprise. That's how it was. And uh, then, you know, I started streaming. My stream started doing better. And uh, there was a degree of, like, stress that that created. But, and, and in terms of, like, my lifestyle and everything, uh, living that way, I never really thought about it at that point. I never really worried too much about like kind of how 
uh, you know, people would perceive me. I always viewed myself as like, you know, this is just who I am. This is what I am. That's all there is to it. And I never really took that. I still don't really take any criticism or any negativity to heart. I don't take it personally. I don't really care a whole lot. And so at the end of the day, it never really bothered me and people thought it was funny. And so, you know, I had like these uh, snack box and there were like uh, maggots in the snack box and I would eat the food with the, the maggots inside of the food. It was like honey buns, which were really, really good. And to be honest, I didn't even really taste them. So it was pretty much the same thing. It didn't even bother this man has no ick. He gets no ick factors. He has none of the ick. He doesn't get ick. That's my theory about Asmund. My theory is like he doesn't get the ick. When I was in Belize, there were termite nests on a tree. And the, the guide we were with, he poked it. He had us poke it with our fingers, pull out the termites and eat them, which I did because, you know, you know, I just, I'm the got to try it once kind of girl. I don't think I could try maggots in my in my bars. You know what I'm saying? Like fresh termites out the nest. I did it. I did do it. But this, I think I'm too pretty for this, you know? And so, uh, you know, I, I had like taken at that point, you know, my teeth are like totally rotten out. And so I had taken pliers to like break pieces of my teeth off. Even, uh, you know, like if I wasn't able to speak during a stream, because like a point was like, you know, poking my tongue or like, uh, you know, playing a, a game or something like that, talking to people. And so uh, I still have the pliers actually in my in my bathroom from all the way back then. And uh, so this had happened for, for quite a while. And uh, then uh, I guess you could say. Uh, I, I started, like, I guess, like, the second phase of my life of, like, trying to remove myself from, like, caring about, uh, like, uh, being worried about the outcome of other people. Uh, mm. It was always very scary for me to know that, like, you know, my mom would die uh, mm. one day, right? This was extremely scary. This was, like, the one thing that I didn't want to have happen. And in 2021, it did happen. And so leading up to that was incredibly stressful. Mm. Um, she pretty much did everything that she possibly could. I love her, but she did every thing that she could to make things as absolutely unpleasant as possible oh. <laughs> this man unconditionally loves his mother he unconditionally loves his mother this is unconditional love when you can talk about somebody being so annoying and laugh about it you're like oh my god you're making this so unpleasant and it's like kind of funny but you're like oh my god my life you are stressing me out it's so sweet how much he loves his mom Oh my God. And so, yes, yes, yes. Uh, it was very frustrating to deal with somebody like that, but you know, she was 70 at the time. Wow. And so it really, really, really hurt. And, uh, it, it's, you know, like she was the main person in my life that I was like most connected to. And like, you know, this is the person that I had like the deepest emotional connection with and to just lose them. It was kind of random by the way, like things got worse over time, but it was nothing like at the, the very end there. It just kind of went off cliff. Mm. And so this happened. And then at about the same time, a little bit after that, I uh, also broke up with a long-term girlfriend at the time. And then at the same time, my dad got so sick that mm. we were like talking about writing his will, like, and, and he's still oh. setting all that up because he doesn't know if this is going to happen again, right? What's going to be? And he's 77 too. So it's, it's rough, right? Oh. It's bad. And uh, he went through pneumonia four times in a year. And so, and he's still, still getting around, you know, going to the store, etc. but I got to help him every once in a while too. Right. And, uh, it is what it is. And so again, and, and, you know, we don't have any family around here. And so, you know, if something goes wrong, if something's bad, uh, there's one person who's responsible for that. And that's me. And hey, that's true. You know, one of the perks of being a one of not, one of 10 is that I can move across the country or to a different country rather. And I know my siblings can take care of my parents. Cause like, that's the thing that I'm worried about. Like I'm staying in Croatia. We want to take care. I want to take care of my in-laws, obviously. And then like my, my siblings, they have my parents, but like, you know, it's, there is a responsibility there to be fair. We all love our parents and we want to take care of them, but Asmund's an only child. So he, it, the burden falls on him and he does love his parents and they love him. So it's also like a desired burden. I know like as a person who has friends who have, are only children, you know, they either love your parents and you want to do it because it's a part of your joy or you don't want to do it and you feel obligated because you're the only child. And I'm like, that's hard either way. But obviously, you know, it is what it is, right? And so that's a lot of stress. It's a lot of, a lot of uh, pressure, right? And, uh, you know, I had all three of these things happen to me within pretty much one year of each other, maybe two years with the thing with my dad. And so at that point, I began the second part of, I think that like, you know, my 
uh, you know, abstraction of reality is that I've tried my best to remove myself from caring about other people as much as I can and not caring about them in terms of like, you know, being friendly. Of course, I'm friendly with people, but being emotionally attached to having them in my life, being emotionally attached to the way that they feel about me and how they're doing. Uh, it's been very hard for me to actually have any toward, sort of feelings towards people when it seems like everybody that was important to me is fucking dying. Trauma. This is an attachment thing, right? This is where I would say, like, you know what helps with this? Therapy. You know, it's a valid experience, but you know what helps with this? Therapy. Because everybody will die. This is why I say, this is why I practice a level of joy and radical acceptance that everybody in my life will die. But also, it was never my journey to keep them here anyways, like, I love my family and friends, but I radically accept, like, tomorrow I could get the call. Right? How many people just died in the hurricanes? That's somebody's family. Somebody's family just got the call that your family didn't make it out of the hurricane area. That is so sad, man. That is so sad. And that is somebody's family has to get that call. I accept it could be mine. My brother lives in Texas, and the hurricanes hit him one year, lost his car, lost his apartment. Everything was flooded. I went and saw him. I visited him during the time I was road tripping. And we were lucky he was on the third floor. But the whole building was condemned after because it all went above. So at the end of the day, like, you never know when it's going to be. But that's why, you know, you have to accept that it's, a, it's not about hoarding people. It's about releasing them to their, it's their journey. And you're just here when it intersects with yours. Right. That's how I think about it personally. And so uh, this or, or leaving me. Right. Or, or breaking up with me. So at a certain point, you just kind of get away from that. And uh, then after that, uh, I, you know, we entered into, I would say, the third phase, which is the point where I, I you know, lose the connection with myself. And I, I think that whenever I finally do that, I think that maybe one day I might be happy again. And what I mean by that is that I always worry about like dying and you know all this stuff and like mm. how, how I'm you know like where, where where do you go what happens right and uh, it would be very very stressful for me and I usually reassure myself by reminding myself that I'm just a hyper intelligent monkey that probably evolved too fast and I think that we all are by the way it's not like I'm special and uh, that usually is uh, oddly reassuring but otherwise um, it was very stressful for me and I did think that I was farther along I thought I would be okay with dying until I thought that I was dying and then I realized that I was recently Asman had a health scare. Right. So this is this is the thing that I think is so important is that Asmin is self-aware. I think in some ways I still think he's like a three or maybe I think he's a three, but I think he's like on the verge of the next step. And I do think he's going to find his joy. I think Asmin is so perfectly. He has the perfect set of tools to go on that introspective journey. Right. So I think, I think he'll get there, but I, I love that he's self-aware. He knows it's about facing himself. He knows it's all about these things. And that's what it always is about. It's about facing ourself, right? Wasn't as far along as I thought I was uh, recently whenever I had a blood pressure reading of 194, which uh, is a high score so far, um, you know, at least so far. And so uh, things have been improving since then, by the way. But anyway, um, this has been, uh, you know, my life. And uh, I, 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 I stopped really caring about anything. I Shout out to Marcus Aurelius's meditations. It's a great book if you want to read it. But Catherine in chat says he states that death is attributed to the natural course of the universe and therefore it is nothing we should fear. 1000%. To die, to live is the same. I, I deeply believe this, which is why I hold no grudges. I am not going to fight with you. I really am rooting for everybody to have a good relationship with themselves because at the end of the day, like we're just here and then we're gone. Like nature, we are nature and nature ebbs and flows. We are not guaranteed tomorrow, but you know, right now is pretty good. So like use every moment to kind of have a better relationship with the fact that you are nature and to be one with your nature is to accept that you are free flowing within it. In my opinion, that's how I think about it. I stopped caring about what happens to me. I stopped caring about what happens to other people. I stopped caring about what people think about me. And I felt that the more that I have the, le the, the more that I've cared about things, the more unhappy I've been as a person. But remember, it's not, and I don't, I'm not speaking for Asmund, I'm just saying in general, it's not that you say, ugh, I don't even care about anything. Everything is stupid. I don't care about lying or cheating or murder. I don't just, I don't care. It's about saying that I have no control over things that I have no control over. 
and I'm not going to invest unneeded spoons into things that have no connection or attachment to me. I'm simply here to exist. When we say like, you don't even exist, bro. We're saying like, you exist in the same way that a rock exists. You are just a part of the greater rock. You are part of the greater ecosystem of the earth. But humans have this ego and this great thing that evolved over time to convince themselves as a species that they ascend nature. You do not ascend nature. You're simply nature ascended, but you are not ascending nature. You're just nature. And nature has a different relationship with itself, whether you're the hurricane or the floods or the mudslides or the humans on the rooftops that are getting swept away. The animals in the forest mourn just like the humans who mourn their families. You are not different from them. And your arrogance to think you are is what's going to keep you trapped in this inability to really experience joy before you die. Because you will die. You'll be recycled back into the universe. And then that was your time on Earth. And who knows what happens after, girl, because I certainly don't know. And uh, I think that this is true on like a base level. Uh, is this some sort of pathological problem for me? I think it probably is. But at the end of the day, uh, this is the best way that I know to cope with it, right? And so for me- I love his language here, very self-aware. Cope, this is the best way. Is it pathological? He's very aware. I love that. The way that I live and everything is a manifestation of that. Uh, it's always been this way for me. Uh, my mom, like growing up, things were pretty messy, etc. But then even now, things are worse than they ever have been in terms of like being messy. But, uh, you know, I never really think about it or worry about it because I'm just never really, it, it doesn't even cross my mind. I'm thinking about things that I want to think about. I'm doing things that I want to do. Mm. And I never think about what other people think about me. I don't think about how it affects other people. I don't think about how they feel or anything like that. And uh, it might sound like a bad thing, but it's made me a happier and more fulfilled person, uh, not worrying about anybody else really other than myself unless I have to. And um, it's been very like uh, weird. Uh, for you know how everybody, we were talking about friendships earlier. And everyone's like, don't you want friends? You mean, don't I want burdens? That's why I say my cat is my favorite burden. My family is my favorite burden. My friends are my favorite burden. But y'all a burden. I just don't think it's a bad thing to be a burden. I think life is a burden. I'm happy to do it. I think we live in this like illusion of aren't you happy you exist? Aren't you happy you get to pay taxes? Aren't you happy you get to deal with war? Aren't you just so lucky to exist? Ma'am, Palestinians are dying. Okay, Lebanon is being bombed. Hurricanes just hit America and people are getting swept off their rooftops. Okay, don't talk to me about me like loving life, okay? And at the same time, yes, it is exciting to experience and to be experienced. Yeah, life is pretty cool. It is better when I don't have to deal with people though. And it is better when I don't have to deal with nature itself coming right at me, girl. Okay, so with peace and love, it's like... You know, you're sitting here and telling people like you should want to live. Okay, well then make taxes more reasonable and make housing more reasonable. Because human beings are just like animals trying to figure out where they're supposed to land. And then don't get upset when one of us figures out how to do it without bringing the community with us. Because the community wasn't working in our favor anyways. I think people are mad at Asmin for not being a community player. And I think I'm mad at the community for thinking we're obligated to a community that's willing to throw us under the bus the moment we want to do something different. You can't do it that way, they say. Why not? Well, it's just not how we do it. Well, what if we did it that way instead? No. Okay, but like, what if we did it that way instead? Look, if you don't want to change the script, don't be mad at people who make up their own. For me. Uh, getting older especially and uh you know like having like priorities change in your life and you know having different things happen to you and so i wanted to make this video and kind of like explain like kind of how i got to be this way and hopefully uh, a little bit of this can like explain why do i behave this way why am i like this why do i have no shame with things right uh it's because I i've lived a life where i've tried desperately to hold on to any degree of dignity that i've had and anything that i've had and it's just slowly been taken away from me uh whether it's myself pieces of myself uh other people uh or uh, the way that the world sees me. Uh, I think that the more that I've kind of just, you know, let things flow freely and not care about it, the more happy and content that I've been. And so uh, it's an ongoing process and uh, began whenever I said, you know, I guess I said I was like 13. And, uh, you know, I, I guess the last thing for me to do is really to let go of myself and, mm. you know, just finally be content with my own existence for the time. Ooh, fire, bro. Let's go. Let's go. That I exist. And uh, I'm not really a religious person. I'm not a spiritual. Maybe, you know, 
Uh, I, I, I guess the I want to rewind it. Last thing for me to do is really to let go of myself and you know just finally be content with my own existence for the time that I exist. And uh, I'm not really a religious person. I'm not a spiritual person either. I don't believe there's any light at the end of the tunnel. I definitely don't think so. And uh, I just try to make the best of uh, being in the tunnel. And so that's why I live the way that I do. That's why I do the things that I do. That's why I say the things that I do. That's why a lot of criticism and things like this, of course I don't like it. Of course I don't like it. But um, it doesn't really emotionally affect me in the same way that I think it does for other people. And it used to affect mm. me a lot more, but I've mm. you know, you know, know, gotten a little bit better at least at dealing with it. And so hopefully this can answer some questions. Because I'm assuming, like he said, he used to play to the bubble a lot more. And then he was like, I don't like the bubble. I want to be in a different bubble. And he's like, I don't want to be in any of your bubbles. And I agree with him. This is why I'm very specific about who I make connections with, especially moving forward. It's why, um, you know, again, I'm having a relationship with myself and I want to make sure that I'm always thinking about that journey and what I'm doing in my life. And I really, I do radically accept in so many ways through daily practice that I am just here and who knows if I'm here tomorrow. You know, there was a, we had a conversation on the discord once and it ended up putting us in two different groups of people, Right. And the, the idea was like, okay, the knowing versus the believing bubble. When you, like, if I turned on my phone right now, I don't have it on me right now, but if you turned on your phone, would it turn on? Yes or no? Like if you click the button from the screensaver, would it light up? And I said, I don't know. And then there was a camp that was like, yes, of course. It worked a second ago. It would work now. And I said, I don't know that. So I'm the kind of person that goes, knowing is knowing and believing is believing. I believe my phone will turn on, but I don't know that. And then one camp was like, but it, there's no reason why it wouldn't turn on. So I know it's going to turn on. But see, I don't know that. Because in the split second that I t turned the screensaver on, like maybe that's the moment the phone decided to die on me forever. And then when I go to turn it on next time, it won't. So I'm never shocked. Like when I turn on my phone and it's freaking out, I'm like, oh, look at that. Like I never assume to predict the future. So if something happens, I'm like, oh, look at that. I, I don't have to be surprised anymore because I'm like, oh, yeah, that was a part of the possibilities. Like, oh, somebody you love went through psychosis and stabbed you? Yeah, that that makes sense. I still wouldn't want that person punished, by the way, because I really definitely, my heart goes out to people in psychosis. See how other world people make the world awful? The person in psychosis isn't the problem. It's how the people react to them, by the way. The person in that situation who's bad isn't the person in psychosis who stabs somebody. It's how they react to that person stabbing somebody. Because that's like blaming an Alzheimer's patient or somebody who's like losing their literal mind like for losing their mind. How do you blame someone for doing something that's predictable, right? What you do is you create a construct that allows them to heal rather than causing them to suffer, even if they cause suffering. But I think that's too much for people, right? That's that's too that's way too forgiving for people, right? And I think that that's fair. I'm just like in the forgiving stage of my life where I'm like humans are going to human because to hold on to this idea that people could be predictable is true on a macro, but on a micro, the nuance is so... Mwah, right? So mm, it's specific, right? So with Asman, I think he's having like that next stage of realization, which I think is so powerful. And it's also why he isn't very attached to many things. I like it. I like it about him that he's not very attached. He's so like, he's good with who he is. And we can only hope that we live in a world where people are good with who they are. Because believe it or not, a lot of the people that are hurting you most of the time. I just think they're very not happy with who they are. I think they're not happy with their relationship with self. At least Asmin's relationship with self impacts mostly himself. And he is self-aware to know when it impacts other people. And kind of uh, give people a little bit more insight into my life and the kind of person I am. And uh, that's pretty much about it. I, I, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I have to cover. 30 minute video, actually I was expecting it to be longer. So. You know, that's my life story. That's what's happened to me in general. And uh, that's why I am the way I am. And uh, will I ever change? Uh, maybe, maybe not, right? I mean, I, I honestly, like, you know, making a lot of money on Twitch and, you know, like the notoriety and everything, like people recognize you. I mean, I just... It, it that I, I mean, I guess it's nice, right? And I mean, sometimes it, 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 it's, I mean, it, having money is way better than not having money. Mm -hmm. But in terms of like, you know, having a lot of wealth, 
Uh, I live in my same house. I use my same desk. I, you know, for a very long time drove my same car. Uh, I eat in the same places. I do the same things. I really haven't changed at all, honestly, uh, ever since I was like younger, uh, ever since my streams got popular. And uh, maybe one day I will, maybe one day I won't. At the end of the day. Um, I love that. I love his openness to change. Because true, like who knows who I'll be in two years, but right now I'm this person. And like, she's so interesting. I can't wait to meet me at 40. And that's what Asmin's trying to say. He's like, I will change. Maybe I won't change. Who knows? I love, he's so open to whatever is will be. And I think that that is such a wonderful place for people to be in. But how many people are stressed about like, what about five years from now? What about 10 years? All you can do is what you're doing today for the future. Of course, like I'm thinking about retired Brittany, but I'm still like making sure that this Brittany is living in the present and it takes practice right? Because I used to be that person, right? In my 20s and my teens, all my life. For 30 years, I was stressing, bro. And then I was like, how do I let go of this stress? And it's about accepting the, the right amount of stress. Like I always accept that stress will occur, but now it's about examining the stress as happening around me or to my body, but not to me. You know, like my body is so stressed right now and I'm just here to witness the experience that my body's having. Like, I'm here to witness my thoughts and witness the experience. I'm like, interesting. Okay, this is, I guess, what we're doing right now. This is like where Mother Nature has brought us. This is where life has brought us. Um, I think that one thing that I've always really kind of focused on and thought about a lot is that uh, I have complete and absolute agency over my own life. Uh, I can do anything that I want to do, and I cannot do anything that I don't want to do. And I think that's been a very uh, comforting fact. And so people ask me, like, are you ever going to do this? It's not something I'm really thinking about changing right now, but in the future, I might change my mind. Uh, I just don't know yet. And so I just try to live life and enjoy it and, uh, you know, uh, be able to uh, experience things for the way that they're meant to be experienced. Mm. And um, Really, I don't care a whole lot about that even either. Um, I don't care about, you know, going out or having certain life experiences or, oh, you'll regret this. Well, who cares if you regret this when you're old? You're about to die anyway. It doesn't even matter. And so uh, I've never really felt that way. It's just not, it's not in me. And so uh, that's really my whole life. And um, that's why I live the way that I live. It's why I do things the way that I do things. And, um, you know, maybe one day it'll change. Maybe one day it won't. Who the fuck knows? Who knows? Tune in next time and find out. So anyway, guys, uh, hopefully uh, this is a little bit more uh, informative, etc. And uh, shit, I got an early uh, end for the day. We had to record something early, so I came home. I figured I'd record this, and uh, it's only 6 p.m., and so I, I don't know what the hell to do with myself now. I'm not streaming. I'm going to go walk around my house like an NPC. And so, like, I don't know what to do. I'm probably going to go play video games. So anyway, guys, uh, thank you all very much for watching. Thanks for listening if you've gotten this far. And uh, yeah, um, things have been going great for me recently. And uh, I want to say thank you to everybody who's been so supportive and everything. And, uh, you know, uh, my best way that I can say thank you is uh, by doing more of it. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. And uh, that's about it. Peace. Bye, Asmin. Love you. Okay, chat says, bro is single-handedly rediscovering Buddhism from scratch. There's so much good stuff here. And I really just want to encourage it in people. And look, I'm still rooting for all of them. I'm rooting for Sneeko. I'm rooting for Asmin. I'm rooting for everybody to have a relationship with themselves and figure it out and dissect it. But it is so hard, especially when there's so much reward from other people not to. And that's why when I say when you stop living for other people, you also stop living for their desire to see you fail. People like misery really does love company. Misery loves company. It's a great way to feel validated in your misery is hanging around with other miserable people. I promise you, I promise you the healthier and happier you get, the less miserable you will be and the less likely you are to keep miserable people around you. And the more you'll have people around you who want to see you win, even if they disagree with you. And it's very interesting. Like it's a very interesting experience. <sighs> Realizing like once you do better, You'll see, you know, where journeys like, you know, stay on course and where journeys deviate. It's okay that journeys change. There is nothing wrong with people in your life going a different direction, right? All you can do is live life to the fullest and then you die. And that's pretty good. That's pretty much good enough, right? Chad says, but if he's still not joyful, isn't something wrong? Isn't something wrong he's doing. I believe what he says for the most part, but sometimes I feel like a cope. He's still moving out of fear. Well, first of all, he said he's not joyful. He explicitly said he's not happy and is explicitly trying to be happy again, but he is happy enough. So I think you maybe misheard that part, but he is explicitly saying he's still on the journey. And also he's not doing anything wrong. You are not, there's not, wrong is a construct. You are not wrong for not being joyful. 
I think you're out of sync with your joy, but you're not wrong. The wrong is a construct. So he's not doing anything wrong. He's on a journey. Sneeko and everybody else, they're not doing anything wrong in a philosophical sense. They're doing something outside of their joy, which is out of sync with their joy, which you could say is wrong. But I would argue that moralizing it is a mistake. I would say that instead you could say that being out of sync is a decision that you have to make in the moment, but you can get out of it and have a different moment. But I think Asman is explicitly saying, right? He's explicitly saying that he is still trying to face himself, but he's not sure if he'll do it. So I think that's pretty powerful. So I'm always rooting for it. I'm always rooting for people to face themselves. And I think if anyone's going to do it, it's going to be Asman for sure. I think it is going to be him. Chad says, Sneeko is now questioning the white supremacist Christians. Now I have a teeny, a bit of hope. Rashad was talking about it. Yeah, I saw that. And I do hope so, right? Like, Sneeko is introspective. He just is stuck in a bubble right now. And whether or not he pops it is up to him. Right? Like, he's young. He has an opportunity. He could do it. Even if he was old, he could do it. But at the end of the day, like, who knows? He feels very self-righteous, and that's one of the problems with bubbles is they make you feel really good about very bad opinions. People feel very good when the rest of them are, you know, when you're being cheered on, when you have a bunch of people validating you. You know what I mean? Like, you have that dopamine of, like, approval hitting you so good, and you're like, yeah, I must be doing something right. Everybody around me is telling me I'm doing it right. It's like those little preacher kids that are preaching in tongues and everyone around them is like, oh my God, oh my God. And the, the little kid doesn't even know why he's there and he's being interviewed by Oprah, but he's like, I feel Jesus Christ inside me. It's like the valid, yes, vibrancy says the validation. It's very addicting. Of course it is, which is why you let go of the attachment of the validation to find your true self. Who would you be if you didn't need the validation from everybody else? This is one of the exercises I do with my callers is we talk about it. Like, who would you be if I just take you in your apartment? Okay, guys, like you're in your place. You're no one's here. No one's there. You know, everybody, you know, everyone's outside your apartment, but no one's, no one's here. Right. Okay. What do you want to do with your life? What direction would you go in? What do you want? Without that pressure of everyone else's voices, what do you want? Where would you go? What would you really want to do with your every day? How would you really want to spend every hour? I think a lot of people like fantasize about not working, but I actually don't think that's true. I think they fantasize about being able to work on their own time or in ways that feel good, maybe. But work is just existing as to work. So even the relationship we have with this idea of work is really interesting, right? What would you wanna do? What would really give you fulfillment? And then how do you make that work within the constructs of the world? Because we still live in the world. Is irrationality objective? I don't understand how people manage to disregard logic in order to inflate their ignorance and opinions within their bubbles. Rational, uh, rationale is the Lord of all things. I think rationality is a construct. I don't think it exists. I think rationality is connecting the dots to come to conclusions that feel sound or are good based off data. But I think people convince themselves they're rational when they're not. And I think it's because the construct convinces you that if you're being rational, you must be coming to good conclusions. But the whole world is built off of irrationality. So the question I just asked, it might be too personal to answer, so don't feel like a need to. But if that is your goal, not only is it available to you, most likely if it's within reason, of course, but it's a matter of like, do you actually want it or does it just sound good? The thing we do when we fantasize, and this is why you have to be very honest with yourself. What do you actually want to do? Not the dream part of you, not the part of you that's 12 years old. And you're like, I want to live on a yacht and eat shrimp off tits. Like, okay, not that dream. The real you, the core you, the person who's like, this is what's fulfilling. Not the version of you that's like, oh my God, if I could like, if I was six, seven, I'd be a basketball player. Okay, not that dream, the real thing that coincides with you. And then why aren't you doing it? Because the truth is most of you want very attainable dreams. Most people want very attainable goals. Most people just wanna have a happy life, you know, have food to eat and a good family, very attainable. So why don't you have it? What's the thing that ma that's making you think you don't, you don't have it? Because most of these people that are chasing like money and monetary success, they get there and they're like, what the fuck? why aren't I happy? It was never about yachts. It was always going to be about something deeper. And most people, I think we're simple. I think we just want to live happy and safely. So then how do we get that? And that is a very hard answer to find in a world that like gives you the tools <laughs> a little at a time. Okay. You don't always get it every year 
or every minute or every day. So you may de- you might have to wait, which is why patience is such a virtue because you don't know when you're going to get the tool to figure it out. Let's see. Um, though isn't most data based on observation, which gives us greater insight into the world around us. Therefore, it does not fall within the bounds of nature. Then it holds no weight. I think this is like you sound. Okay. I don't know what bubble you're coming from, but it sounds like you're in a very specific philosophy bubble, which is valid, but it sounds like, I don't believe in limitation and limitation. I don't believe in limitation based off belief. And sometimes I think certain bubbles use rationality to limit themselves because the belief around rationality is that it leads to only amount, a number amount of X conclusions. And so I'm, hesitant around people that use rationality in their sentence structure because it's within rationality that people would come to the conclusions they have in life. Irrationality is just as rational because it makes sense within the real, like within the idea of nature being itself. Like if humans are nature and a part of nature, then irrationality is a part of that nature, which is rational. Like it makes sense that people come to irrational conclusions because they're working off the data they have. So when I explain to people like you're being irrational, I'm I'm usually saying that within the data that you have, you're even being too irrational. It is irrational for conservatives to, you know, want the government out of people's business, but then to limit like gay marriage and abortion. Because at the end of the day, like, do we want government out of our business or not? Right? Within their own idea of what their belief is, their own rationale. So I think there's this idea of like objective that I personally don't think humans have access to. I think objective is outside of space and time. It's outside of perception. And since we only have our perception, we only have an idea of objective, usually connected to the idea of what the majority thinks is correct. But I think we just don't know. I think we know very, very little. And I feel pretty confident about that just based off of listening to the professionals. Like listening to scientists, it's so clear how little we know, but we have enough belief to get us to the next juncture of knowing, which is really cool. I think we're babies on a planet. And I think in like 5,000 years, we'll have so many answers that would like blow our minds now, but we just don't have access to it. So I'm personally kind of open to anything within reason that has enough data to support it. Um, That makes sense. But I know it's all a construct. Look, I know borderline and all these things we're naming autism and all these things we're naming gay and straight and man and woman, like all of it could be eroded tomorrow because of new information. Right. And I'm, I'm here for it. I think like I'm so open to whatever will be, but I do want it to be as close to the objective as we can get. Right. I do want it. I want, I want to know what the objective is. I just don't know if we have access to it because we're so faulty as thinkers that I don't know if I trust human beings to have that access, but I am so curious. I will spend my life looking for it and die not knowing. And I'm pretty satisfied with that personally. Um, but I am so, I really want to know too. You said I'm a, I'm a, uh, the perspective of a scientist. So I'm definitely consumed by that bubble. I love that though. Like, I love that. And I, I think at the end of the day, like science is one of the most curious bubbles And at the end of the day, as long as we're curious and open, I think we'll get always closer. But God knows I'm going to die without knowing. But I'm going to spend my time figuring it out all the same. And people would say, like, what's the point of that? If you're going to die not knowing, then why study it or why try to figure it out? I don't know. It sounds interesting. I don't know. It's like the most interesting thing I could do with my time. And I just want to do whatever I want with my time. And that's what's interesting. But I don't know if it will matter. But it's very fulfilling. Yes, exactly. Emmy says, what else is there to do? What else is there to do, girl? Okay. All right. So great conversation, Asmin, as usual, causing the debate, causing the discussion. Very curious to see who else will react to this. I have a feeling Abba and Preach might do it just because they recently um, contacted Asmin to say like, hey, we hope you're doing well. We'd love to see you here. And like, we would love to see Asmin get better, of course, but whatever his journey will be, it will be. It is not my job to decide how long Asmin lives. It's only my job to enjoy him while he's here because I do not control Asmin. Stuff
cause I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, 